Hi, welcome to Detours, Understanding Acquired Brain Injury. Um, today, I want to talk to you about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. We've seen a lot of discussions about this, and we've seen it on the news and in movies and things like that. Um, so today, we're going to do a survey, a quick, well, relatively quick, um, review and overview. Um, the thing is that CT is a kind of complicated topic, and so I'm going to do other videos on it, but I just want to talk about things like wh what it is and a little bit about the pathology behind it and talk about some symptoms and talk about like just who's affected some of the statistics a little bit. And later on, we'll get more in depth, but at least I want to address it and get things started for this um, because I think it's important um, just because of how much you see about it and how many people are affected. Um, so what is chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Um, its name tells you a lot about it. Um, it. The thing to keep in mind about it is that it is not a single it is not caused by a single event it is cumulative it is a progressive disorder it is a disease um, that is caused by repeat blows to the head um, there are a lot of ways that this happens um, we used to call it um, punch drunk syndrome back way back over 100 years ago and often much thought wasn't given to it what happens uh, the first people we noticed what was later described as CTE were boxers um, physicians who worked with uh, the fight physicians had noticed that those boxers as they're getting on in years seemed to have symptoms resembling Parkinson's um, they would have coordination problems they would have problems with more than the usual kind of aggression and they would have symptoms that just look like other neurological disorders that were in the 1920s kind of newly being explored. And so they described the symptom and they labeled it dementia pugilastica. Um, so basically a fighter's dementia. Um, so, and that's really as far as it went but over the decades as american football became more popular caught on 50s 60s 70s became really big um they started to notice that football players had symptoms like this too especially after a long career those who took a lot of hits mm -hmm. the linemen quarterbacks and these guys also were starting to show would show parkinson's like symptoms they would go to the neurologist and say hey you know what's what's going on here and initially, nobody really put the pieces together. And so with further research and doing MRIs and stuff, it's like, gee, nothing's really clearly showing up here. There's loss of brain tissue. But it's like, what's... Over time, um, we noticed that a lot of other people who had taken repeat blows to the head, um, anyone from, like, no, and not just here, but but rugby players, soccer players who did a lot of heading of the ball, um, you know, martial artists, um, all kinds of folks, women of domestic women who experience domestic violence. This is really important. Who've taken a lot of hits to the head or been slammed into the wall. They also show chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, seizure patients who hit their head repeatedly in seizures. Um, really anybody who has taken a lot of hits to the head and has typically mild concussive symptoms, but some of the research suggests that even those who have sub-concussive blows, where you're just kind of a little, you know, shaken or a little shaken up, is sufficient to cause chronic traumatic encephalopathy. We really don't know what it is that makes, that pushes over the line how many hits it takes what it takes we just know that it takes blows to the head to cause this um as i said it is a progressive disease so it gets worse over time and it is chronic and is progressively fatal um 
In many ways, it resembles Alzheimer's disease. It is what is called a tauopathy. Um, tauopathies are marked by abnormal tau proteins. Tau proteins help stabilize the way a neuron is put together, is held together, it's cytoskeleton. Inside every cell is a skeletal kind of structure, um, which is used to help it maintain structure and stability. Unfortunately, in cases of tauopathies, uh, of which CTE is one, but they're Alzheimer's, um, frontotemporal dementia seems to be one, and there are a couple other disorders that also um, seem to have this characteristic too, which are tauopathies caused by malfunctions of tau proteins. Um, and so, and they all seem to follow a similar course in that they are fatal. Um, they are degenerative. They increasingly destroy areas of the brain. Um, and one of the things about a lot of the tauopathies, including CTE, is unfortunately the only way we can make a firm diagnosis is on autopsy. Um, imaging is not clear enough or good enough to definitively tell someone that they have CTE. You can, physicians have some criteria now. The neurologist voted on what they feel would be definitive potential criteria, but there are no what are called biomarkers. There's nothing, you can't draw blood from somebody and say, oh yes, this is absolutely a sign of a CTE. There are some markers, autobiomarkers, which are basically there are proteins that say, yes, it looks like aberrant tau proteins are present, but there's always tau protein present and a lot of it. And quite often there are different forms of the tau protein present, even in a healthy brain. And so it's still not clear. There are different techniques that are, we are developing. There's diffusion tensor imaging. Um, there is uh, fMRI and there is a PET scanning where we use specially marked proteins with a tag it with a radioactive marker and then it locks on to these aberrant tau proteins. But again, this is all still mostly in the lab and some of the high level uh, universities and some of the, the universities that are known for doing research, neuro research. I don't, you know, I want to make that clear. Um, there are attempts at treatment, but right now we just don't know enough about what causes the initial triggers. We know that repeated concussions are necessary, but the chain of events inside the neurons, it's still difficult to call out clearly. Um, we know that hyperphosphorylation is involved, that the way that the protein, the tau protein is formed seems defective. Some enzymes are probably not clipping the tau protein correctly. And this aberrant tau protein then does not form the cytoskeleton, the, the structural form of the neuron correctly, and causes it to misfold. And when that is misfolded, it forms these thick tangles, neurofibrillary tangles, which then stick the neurons together and form these rough, insoluble clumps. And that chokes neurons to death when the cytoskeleton is damaged, and then it kills other adjacent neighboring neurons, and it seems to transmit these defective tau proteins from neuron to neuron to neuron, which is what causes the progressive degeneration. Um, that's, as, that's pretty far along as far as what we know, but we're not sure like why these neurons are inappropriately clipped why, or why the uh, tau proteins are inappropriately hyperphosphorylated why they're misshapen, why the wrong type of tau protein is selected because of repeated hits. Why? We don't know. Genetics seems to play a role for vulnerability. Seems to. But there's there are clearly other factors, too. Um, a person can have CTE and Alzheimer's. There are differences between CTE and Alzheimer's. Um, there are certain proteins that are not present in CTE that are present in Alzheimer's, which also makes it harder to detect. Uh, the 
symptoms generally uh, are very similar, but again, not quite the same. 30% of people with repeat traumatic brain injury will develop CTE, one third. Um, it's important. That's at least what we understand. And there are about four stages, three, four, depending on the doctors that you talk to and what the surveys indicate. Stage one, you see headache, dizziness, disorientation, confusion. Um, stage two is where memory loss really gets started, although there is some early in stage one, but stage two, and I want to make it clear, these are not clear cut and distinct. They're like kind of a, a, a transition. And so you start to see the next stage of stage two is memory loss, more impulsive behavior with lack of control, um, poor judgment, just acting on impulse. Mm. Um, finally, stage three, you start to get that explosive behavior, more of the emotional reaction, explosive anger, aggression, um, paranoia, um, sensory problems. You'll start to see tremoring, vertigo, more depression, although that seems to be present throughout. Um, more cognitive deficits. This is where these problems start to stand out. Uh, executive dysfunction, planning. We've talked about executive dysfunction, problems with planning, thinking ahead those sorts of things. And finally, stage four is where you get the serious dementia symptoms that you associate with Alzheimer's. Um, major forgetfulness of loved ones, people that you know, um, getting lost in an area you're well familiar with, um, things like uh, dysarthria, problems swallowing, serious movement disorders that you can't bear weight on your own legs, um, the depression becomes very profound at this point. A lack of drive. Many people commit suicide at stages three and four, although you know, it's, it's obviously a problem throughout the entire disease. And as I said, it is inevitably fatal, um, usually because of swallowing problems and problems clearing mucus and respiratory issues. Um, so that's, again, it's very much like Alzheimer's in that way, too. Mm. Pneumonia is common. Um, there are other symptoms you may see. You may see Parkinsonism, uh, the pill rolling tremors and the cogwheel-like movements. Uh, pathological jealousy is often a symptom. It's a paranoia, paranoid thinking, uh, persecutory delusions. Um, so these are not, it's not a complete list of symptoms that you can get, but this is the typical course. As I said, it's fairly similar to Alzheimer's in that, that tracking of symptoms. Um, and what you, what you would see if you look at a brain that's damaged in this way, atrophy of the frontal lobes and of the temporal lobes, they atrophy significantly, um, loss of large amounts of brain tissue, dilation of the um, ventricles, uh, loss of that, that tissue, um, lateral uh, uh, loss of bilateral destruction of the hippocampus, um, so which explains a lot of the memory problems and problems with spatial orientation. Uh, hippocampus helps both with consolidation of short-term to long-term memory. It also is associated with helping with geographic orientation. Um, uh, destruction of the amygdala over time, so loss of emotional response and the ability to regulate emotionally, and eventually no um, akinetic mutism, uh, so no emotional response, no desire or drive eventually towards the end. Um, destruction of the substantia nigra, the black substance or black stuff, as it's, you know, the, the Latin name for that is. Um, that leads to the, all the Parkinsonisms, all the Parkinsonian symptoms, uh, loss of dopamine, because those neurons are responsible for production of that, and so also affects smooth movement, things like that. Um, destruction of the thalamus, massive loss of brain tissue throughout, and eventually it attacks the brainstem and the cerebellum, which also leads to death. 
um, the treatment, mm -hmm. there really is not much we can do. Um, it's supportive, um, pain control, um, opiates, um, mood helping a patient with uh, antidepressants, uh, anticonvulsants, um, helping with tremors with uh, levodopa. Um, there are certain uh, nootrophics to help with cognition, stimulants to help with executive dysfunction, anti-seizure drugs to help with seizures as well. Um, these kind of treatments, as I said, symptom supportive. Um, there are neurologists who are studying this at length currently, but it mainly is just like with an Alzheimer's patient, mainly help and support and either care at home with home nursing as the patient progresses through this disorder and also providing support then long-term care facilities like nursing homes and the like and with skilled nursing um, as the patient progresses into stage three and stage four. Um, it is important to understand that this is a slowly evolving disorder in most cases. There are those who move more quickly depending. There seem to be sub-variants which also seem linked to disorders like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, um, and there may be other conditions which we're just learning that have linkage um, and um, we're just beginning to explore this as our imaging is getting better using PET scans and DTI. Um, unfortunately, this is one of the more challenging areas of traumatic brain injury research right now, but hopefully as we make more discoveries and as funding continues for Alzheimer's, it will also help us with CT CTE. Um, and hopefully um, with support and funding from a lot of the football players and the other sports um, and the other athletes and the other sports, it will help us make the necessary inroads in order to slow down the progression of CTE. Research is kind of equivocal on whether the Alzheimer's meds slow things down. As it is, there's very few medications for Alzheimer's right now. And so naturally, that would also mean for CTE likewise. But it's important to know they're not the same disorder how the tau proteins behave and how they're formed is somewhat different and how they cut the cytoskeletal uh, structure and how it then shapes itself is different and its transmission mechanism is not clear but there are enough similarities hopefully that some of the treatments will work um, there seems to be mitochondrial involvement um, the complexities were just really beginning to understand now. Um, there are, the measures are mostly preventative. Uh, recommendations for better helmets, making sure they fit, mouth guards, not getting involved in sports where you take a blow to the head, changing of the rules. Um, hard prosecution, really hard prosecution of those who assault somebody. Um, after the first blow to the head, doing whatever is possible to avoid any further, because uh, it does take repeat blows, but we don't know exactly how often. And tracking genetics and autopsies, and please donate to the brain bank if you receive one of these diagnoses to help those of us in the medical field um, in order to make this necess very necessary progress. Um, so, not exactly, not like most, and, and just like many of my other episodes, kind of a bit of a downer. But um, please consider uh, if you have the opportunity to donate to um, research for CTE, the Alzheimer's Foundation, um, towards um, women's shelters and towards like 
for any other funds that are out there to help people who are at risk and towards those who have CTE. There are a number of different funds. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, there will be other episodes I'll have more focused on specific aspects. Uh, have a good day. And goodbye. Please click like and subscribe if you want to learn more. And have a good day.